Hey everyone, welcome back to In Her Wallet, a weekly podcast helping women around the world take control of their finances for good and build better financial futures one episode at a time. My name is Sophia. I'm your host, the founder of In Her Wallet, and also an accredited investment representative here in Canada. Today, I am bringing you a new episode from the Female Entrepreneurship Series, and it's a conversation with Lisa Glebziani, the co-founder of Chexy. If you're like most people, rent is one of your largest monthly expenses, and the Chexy team is disrupting the space by making rent a rewarding experience wherever you bank. In this episode, we chat a lot about building a startup from scratch and raising $1.5 million in a challenging environment as we are in today, but we also take it all the way back to where Lisa started. She moved to Canada from Eastern Europe to get her bachelor's degree from the University of British Columbia and also quickly advancing her career. Lisa has some prominent names under her belt, such as Deloitte and Square, so this episode will be useful for students for women advancing their careers, and also anyone wishing to take a leap of faith and build a business. So without further ado, Lisa, welcome to In Her Wallet, and I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on. Okay, well, I obviously know you personally really well and have known for many years for our audience. Lisa and I are actually good friends. We used to study at UBC together. But Lisa, for those people who do not know you personally, let's do a little bit of an icebreaker so our community can get to know you more on a personal side, outside of the professional things that we're going to be talking about today. Tell me, what's your go-to coffee order? I'm a simple woman, probably like an iced or a regular latte, depending on the season, regular milk. uh, I don't make it too fancy, so pretty simple. I'm a regular milk girl too. And (laughs) tell me, what's the movie you can rewatch again and again? Oh, I think uh, it's less of a movie. It's a whole movie franchise, like huge Harry Potter fan, grew up watching, reading all the books, playing all the games. And I think like I actually have a tradition. I uh, rewatch all of them around Christmas time. I feel like it's kind of a feel good Christmassy movie. Uh, So um, any of those I can have on replay all the time. Me too. And I also love Twilight, that franchise. Oh yeah, I was I was actually thinking Twilight. Uh, yeah, that's also something, I don't know, back from your childhood is a good one. Exactly. That's how you know we're friends. And then last question, if you could travel anywhere in the world right now, where would that be? So I actually did a lot of traveling in Q1, uh, you know, embracing the whole digital nomad thing. Uh, so I would say if there was one place I would be able, to, I would want to go right now. It would be probably back home to Belarus. I was born and raised there. Haven't been able to travel back because of the Ukrainian conflict for the last like almost two years. So I would say actually, if uh, if I could like teleport somewhere and then safely teleport back, that would probably be the place I would go. I I agree with you. I actually share that view as well. I'd love to go home and see my family too. Okay, now we got that out of the way. Can you tell us and walk us through what you're building at Chexy and uh, a quick brief story of who Lisa is? For sure. Yeah, so um, I'll start at kind of the beginning and then we'll finish off about what we are doing now and the problems that Chexy is trying to solve. Um, So like I said, born and raised in Eastern Europe, I actually spent a couple of years studying in um, a boarding school in North Wales, so in the UK, before coming to Vancouver in 2014 and doing my economics degree at UBC. Um, I was one of those kids who knew I wanted to do something related to math, but exactly what that looked like was never really clear to me, probably until like third or fourth year university. So that's one of the reasons I actually didn't go to business school is I thought economics was kind of a little bit more broad, a little bit more numbers focused and allowed me to not have to specialize so early on into something. Um, And then I ended up pursuing a very traditional finance path, um, you know, did a few internships in finance. Then after graduation, went into investment banking, got my CFA, and then went into uh, kind of the startup and the tech world for um, in finance and strategy. So I actually did investment banking at Deloitte for a few years, then transitioned to lead finance and strategy at Square Canada. And then as part of my 
relocation square relocated me to Toronto from Vancouver. So I've been in Toronto now for over two years. Um, I came across a problem I was so passionate about solving, which is surrounding, you know, the rental experience we have in Canada and rental payments specifically. Chexy um, is actually a rental payments platform built for the modern day tenant that allows them the ability to earn rewards and build credit on their largest expense. And this is a problem that is very personal to me. I've been a renter in Canada for the last nine years. I have moved probably seven to eight times in, you know, as a time during, you know, as a student and even as an adult and, uh, you know, eventually even moved coast to coast. And one of the things that was very apparent to me is just how antiquated the system is. But I think the last straw was um, when I moved to Toronto during COVID um, for my job at Square, everything had moved online. People weren't even doing in-person showings anymore for apartments. Yet my landlord insisted I hand deliver her 12 posted checks. And to me, especially coming from Eastern Europe, we, we've never had checkbooks back home. Um, we kind of transitioned from cash to card right away. And so it just, I had to look up how to write a check at 26 years old. I was like, I've never <laughs> written a check before. So um, I think it was kind of one of those moments that because I experienced this problem so many times myself, and also because at the time I'm working at one of the biggest digital payments companies in the world, seeing the kind of adoption of payments across verticals that is COVID is almost spearheading and not seeing it in like the expense that matters the most to me, which is rent, was kind of like that aha moment that really pushed me to think, okay, maybe I can give a shot to solving this problem here. Um, and that's how I ended up where I am today. So obviously we'll dive deeper into the whole startup building journey, but I want to take it back to where it all started. You obviously have a very impressive career path. So let's go back to the times when you were an international student. How do you think that, um, Vancouver School of Economics degree helped shape your path in finance and the career that you were building at Deloitte. I mean, a school like UBC is very competitive. So what set you apart, do you think? So I actually think picking economics was a good and a bad thing in a way for pursuing finance, right? One of the things that I didn't realize um, is that most investment banks or most um, you know investment banking like capital markets like jobs hire direct from business school so and i was not part of solder the business school at ubc um, that also meant i did not have access to the same co-op opportunities that the solder kids did and you know now i think it's gotten better over the last five years but back in the day a lot of these bank jobs a lot of these capital markets jobs they were posted to solder only or to these career like business school career websites only so you wouldn't even see the hiring that was happening not to mention wouldn't be able to apply or you know get that job but i think in a way that was also a good thing because it allowed me and it prepared me much better for what the real you know life of finding a job outside of school is and the real life of finding a job is you don't have a career um, you know, center professional holding your hand and helping you land interviews, you're kind of on your own. And it's a wild bet. And it's an incredibly competitive space. So because I had to fight for those jobs early on, I almost think it was like it was, you know, at the time, I was like, Oh, my God, how am I going to ever be able to compete? But in the end of the day, it, it pushed me to network and build my own network much sooner. And I think that was ultimately the good thing. In terms of the skill set, I generally believe economics is like one of the best degrees that you could do for anything business related, because it gives you um, one of the things that economics teaches you is how to think about things. How do people think about things? How do consumers make decisions? It's not necessarily the most applied subject, but it does teach you how to learn and how to think about problems and how to ultimately solve them, which I think is in general a very good school of thought. Um, but I think doing that in combination with my CFA and learning the actual like ap applied and tangible finance skills was what ended up setting me apart. And I said, and like I said, I think like the hustle of networking and really just putting yourself out there and not letting anything stop you, that serves you well throughout your lifetime, not just in your career. 
Totally agree with you. And as you know, I studied economics as well. And when you were just describing the whole experience of not being able to get access to those even info sessions that were only posted to business school students, now looking back, you understand that that was a, a gift in disguise, if I may yeah. say so. Lisa, but I just remember how frustrating it was. Remember? I know. Like, you, you totally. feel it's so unfair. And I think it's getting better. I think there is more like, Companies are now hiring more outside of business schools, which I think is a great thing because you want to have the diverse skill set on your team. Um, but yeah, I remember it was uh, it was very hard. I had to ask like for uh, my friends from Solder their login information and sneak into info sessions. Yeah. Okay. So now before we uh, transition to the conversation about your time at Square, let me ask you one last question about Deloitte. I mean, obviously, you've been there for two, two, three years, I think, right? Two years? Yeah, two and a half years. So that's a big part uh, of what shaped to you into who you are. What do you some, think some of the skills and experiences you gained during that first full-time job out of university? Um, and how did that contribute to you advancing your career path later on? I think there are things that are specific to M&A and in investment banking that were useful, so I'll touch on those. And I think there are things specific, not even to Deloitte, but specifically the team I was on at Deloitte and my leaders that were incredibly useful. So in general, the reason you see a lot of people started investment banking and spent two to three years in there, even though it's a grind and you're working 100 plus hour weeks, it's not just about like, yes, you, you make a decent amount of money out of graduation. and That's always a great thing. But it's also, um, it teaches you amazing attention to detail. And that's one of the things that is often overlooked, I think, in general, in a lot of jobs, and I think in a lot of education. But because you're working for clients as a, as a banker, and usually you're working on very big deals, your attention to detail is key. One little mistake in a model could cost someone millions of dollars, um, could be also a massive reputational risk for the company that you're representing. That's one of the things I personally actually struggled with massively because I am very much a big picture thinker. I'm not very great with being into the detail, but I think the training that that type of job provided me was incredibly valuable to anything I do now as an entrepreneur. And I think the other part was specifically my team. So in general, in investment banking, as an analyst or an associate, even as a VP, oftentimes you have very little uh, you have very little client facing time because that time is generally spent by MDs presenting your deck and your model, um, but you don't really interact with the, with the client face to face. That was not true completely uh, in my team. So our leaders truly believe that for us to eventually be able to rise up the ranks, we need to learn how to interact with clients, how to sell clients, how to talk to clients from the day one. And um, that was incredibly valuable. And for that, I'm like extremely grateful because not only I met some incredibly interesting people, I do think it, you know, taught me so many of these like interpersonal and soft skills around selling around propositions that eventually is one of the reasons I was able to raise money. And I was able to sell our investors on the vision of the, of the company and um, public speaking and pitching and selling. It's kind of a thing that just really improves over time and when you start so much earlier and very early on in your career, by the time you get to a point where I am now, you're much more comfortable. So I feel like that has been kind of a secret weapon for me in my kind of role right now. Mm -hmm. Lise, so it does sound like you were having a great time at Deloitte. I know you were offered um, promotion right before you left. What motivated you to actually transition from investment banking to leading finance at a startup like Square? I think for me, it was two things. So I knew my first internship ever in finance before Deloitte was at a tech company called Mobify in Vancouver. Actually, a couple of years ago, they were acquired by Salesforce. But that was kind of my first introduction into the startup world as well as into finance world. And I remember how hectic it was and how unprepared I was for it at the time, but how exciting it was being part of a very fast growing and interesting and innovative company. So the reason I went it, into Deloitte was to get that less hectic, hands-on training, teach me how things must be done 
So I'm prepared to eventually take on, again, a role at a fast growing and innovating company. So for me, I always knew I wanted to go back into tech. Um, what that looks like being a finance professional is really you have kind of three options. Um, you what you can go into corporate development. So doing buy side acquisitions for a tech company. You can do strategic finance, which is what I did, more of a business partnering with other uh, departments within the company on how to optimize selling, product pricing, everything to do. You kind of a mini CFO for a product or for a country. And then the third part is going into investment banking and staying kind of that, but specifically for that industry. Unfortunately, in Canada, and um, I was kind of bound by having to stay in Canada as I was still going through immigration, like getting my permanent residency, getting my citizenship eventually. Um, corporate development and buy side for big, like M&A for big tech companies, just those roles like are very far and few in between if they at all exist, right? We don't have, uh, we have like Uber and Amazon, but their corporate development teams are in San Francisco. Um, so that wasn't really an option. And then investment banking for tech companies, again, because we don't have a lot of publicly traded tech companies in Canada, also very far and few in between roles. So strategic finance was kind of the one thing that really stood out as a way to combine all of the things that I wanted to do, stay in finance, do some more operating strategic stuff for a single company while working in a tech industry. And the other part was like, I true one of the best things about working at Square was I truly believed in the, in the mission and the vision, like enabling small, medium-sized businesses to accept payments and allowing them to grow. Um, I thought it was just a beautiful vision. I actually had Square Stock before I ever applied for the job, so I obviously followed the you know the company and the story, and I was very very bought in. And the role that I was joining for was also very interesting because. It allowed me oversight over the entire Canadian market and all the products we had here. So although Canada is like a fraction of Square's revenue, I was like a mini CFO in Canada. And that to me, you know, at the time I was 25 years old, was just an incredible amount of responsibility, but also very exciting because I believed that I could actually make a difference in this local, local market. Um, so that's kind of how it ended up happening. So it was naturally felt like the, the right transition onto the next level. For a startup like Square, I mean, they have all the resources to acquire the best talent, especially for such a high profile position to lead, like you said, you were the mini CFO of uh, here in Canada. What made you stand out and why did they hire you? Uh, great question. I am a big believer that oftentimes it's a combination of you're the right person and a combination of being in the right place at the right time. Um, so I think luck and, you know, being personally like the, the hiring manager personally liking me and getting along with me, I think is a massive thing. And do I think I was the most qualified candidate for the job? Probably not. But I think what made me stand out is I came from a background of a combination of traditional investment banking, as well as previously strategic finance at another startup. So um, a lot of times you would see kind of one or the other, someone who just pursued banking and have never done an operating role where they actually like led the models and worked with departments before, which obviously I had done at Mobify before for over a year. And then at the same time, I had the necessary training, the CFA and all the stuff that comes from being like a big company. And I think that was kind of my unique advantage, like that diverse set of experience and skill sets, uh, because they didn't have concerns that I can model and do all the technical stuff because I came from good training. But they also could tell that I had experience of influencing other business partners, being a stakeholder at the table with other people much more senior to me and helping them run their budgets, helping them optimize their spending. So I think ultimately it was a combination of those two. But I definitely think with anything, luck and being in the right place at the right time is also a massive thing. Well, let's give the credit where the credit is due. I mean, yes, luck happens, but hard work is what paves the way. So, I mean, you're you're great. You I, have to, I, you have I to work never... hard to get lucky. That's the way I think about it. It's, I like you that. have to work hard to put yourself in the right positions where you will be at the right place at the right time. It's not like you're just sitting and waiting for something to happen to you. But I do think that it's like just things that are out of our control 
that often are also very important to consider. So I can't just say and said, you know, I was the best candidate for sure. It's like, I have no idea who the other candidates were. Maybe there were some good candidates, but for some reason, it was my lucky day. <laughs> Walk us through. So from what I remember, you were at Square for just under two years. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. Yeah, I was there um, for just over a year and a half. Um, they moved me, I mentioned, uh, you know, I was based in Vancouver before they have relocated me to Toronto and I actually moved in to Toronto at the middle of COVID and then spent six to nine months in full lockdown, not being able to do uh, anything, see anyone, which is quite depressing. And I think that was rough. (laughs) Yeah, it was rough, but I think maybe all that free time is what ultimately like the move to Toronto, experiencing that problem that I was faced with, you know, with paying rent in general, with the, you know, the frustration around the moving process and having all that free time to, you know, think about it more and have that more at the forefront of your mind is eventually what pushed me to leave Square and really pursue entrepreneurship. So again, we talk about these things as like kind of a gift in disguise. It probably was that. And in general, I'm a believer that, it's going to sound very cheesy, but whatever happens, happens for the best. My entire life, I've been many times disappointed by something, but it actually end up turning out for the better. So I just try to look at it that way. Uh, you kind of actually answered my next question, but I want to dive a little bit deeper because previously both Deloitte and Square Jobs, obviously they're a stable paying job with good medical benefits you were willing to leave that and go after a wild dream. Do you have any tips for for women um, on how to prepare themselves financially for that transition? For sure. And I think that is very key to be ready and to be in the right stage of your life, both emotionally and personally, as well as financially. Um, it is a massive risk when you go into entrepreneurship, especially if like you for five years before you were collecting a very good paycheck and had all the you know benefits and vacation time and life is pretty good. Um, I think one of the things that people often overlook is like, it's very easy for me to say, oh, you should just give it a try, you know, really do it, you know, pursue your passion. But ultimately, you have to take a step back and, and think about whether you are ready. For me, what that looks like is, number one, like like you mentioned, the emergency fund you have, I would say you want to comfortably have 12 months. If you have more, that's great. And it doesn't have to be 12 months at a lifestyle that you're currently living, but it should be 12 months at a lifestyle you're comfortable with. So maybe you're not going to Aridzia every month anymore. Maybe you're not going on vacation three times a year, but you can comfortably pay your rent. You can comfortably, you know, um, pay for your groceries, all the necessary living expenses. And I would say you want to have some money to also spend some time with your friends. Maybe it's not as lavish as it used to be, but if you're, you know, month to month, just spending money on necessities and working on something incredibly stressful, you'll burn out really fast. So on the financial side, I think it's that. And I think on a personal and an emotional side, being an entrepreneur is a constant roller coaster. I mean, you know that yourself, you've also left a very good job. And, you know, I think having the right support system, whether it's your partner, whether it's your friends, whether it's you just looking at it, like, what's the worst that can happen? I think I'm going to have fun. And even if it doesn't work, I know I'm going to learn a lot. And I will be okay on the other end, being in a position in your life where you have confidence that no matter what happens, you will be fine, whether it's finding another job, whether it works out, whether it's something else, you will be okay. I think being in that emotional state is incredibly important because you will be hearing no every day, every week, and that will continue probably until you reach some sort of like a serious B, serious C stage. And um, you have to be very comfortable with that. Thank you for highlighting all of that. I totally agree. Now that we're transitioning into our conversation about building a startup, can you walk us through the process of setting um, of establishing Chexi? What are some of the steps that you did to really set yourself up for success early on? I would say a lot of the stuff that I did, I would not do now if I was starting again. I was a first time founder and you really have no idea what you're doing. 
to be honest. And that's completely natural, right? And that's one of the reasons VCs want to invest in repeat entrepreneurs. Those people have tried, have failed, have tried again, have learned a playbook that works. And now I feel if I was actually starting now, I probably would have pursued and done things a bit differently. But alas, that's learning. For us, in terms of our path, um, we actually joined uh, a day zero, they call them accelerator called Antler in, in Toronto. Um, the difference between like an Antler and like a white combinator is you're supposed to come to Antler with just an idea. Like you haven't really built anything yet. Maybe you have a very, very rough MVP, but realistically you're going with an idea, with some understanding of the market and the problem you're solving to further test and validate that. And then at the end of their 10 week program, you actually get to pitch for funding to them and they fund like a small percentage of the people that they accept into the incubator. So for us, Aptin, my co one of my co-founders and I, that was before we brought Ben, our uh, my second co-founder. We joined Antler January 2022, and uh, we ended up pitching for funding at the end of the program at the end of March last year, and actually we're one of the first five portfolio companies uh, that they've invested in Canada. Um, we raised about uh, $150,000. And it was enough to give us about seven to nine months of experimentation time. Like it's incubated funding, 150K doesn't get you very far, uh, but it's enough to run some of these experiments, build some tech, learn more about the consumer, learn more about the problem. And I think one of the things that that incubator taught us that we weren't doing before as much of is that learning about your consumer and learning about the problem. Because... We were working on Chexy and it was in a completely different, it was a, like a different uh, kind of name and kind of a different product at the time for six months before joining Antler on weekends. And I think the way we were thinking about it was completely wrong. Yes, we did some customer interviews, but we right away were like, okay, we did some customer interviews. We think there is a problem there. We should go and build it. And so we were looking at like deaf companies and, you know, how do we build this? Do we do like a no code tool or something? And one of the things that I realize now is like, we should have just been learning more and more about the market before ever touching the single line of code. So we actually, having raised in April of last year, didn't launch our platform until February of this year. So from April of last year and probably until around October of last, uh, of last year, so for about, I guess, four to six months, we spent even more time doubling down and understanding what are the pain points? How are we different? How are we going to address that? And then we actually brought on Ben, our third, uh, uh, the third co-founder, um, to lead on the tech side in August and started building the platform in around October, which took us about four to five months to get to beta. Um, but I would say if you're thinking about entrepreneurship, the biggest advice I have is like, you think you know the problem and you know the customer, think again. Talk to more people. Talk to other companies who've tried and failed. See the companies that are already in the market. Are they succeeding? Are they failing? If there's nobody else in the market, actually, well, why is there? Is there a market for that problem? So um, spend way more time understanding that before you think about how you're going to build anything, how you're going to incorporate, how you're going to hire people. All of that is much easier than nailing the problem and the fact that it's a painful non problem that people are willing to pay for it. When is the time you understand that you've done enough research and now you have proved to yourself that yes, this problem exists and yes, we are ready to go to market? Honestly, I don't think there's ever that time until you like, you know, people talk about product market fit. I truly believe that there is no such thing as product market fit until you are like scaling series B, series C. Most seed stage startups have not found product market fit. You have 10,000 users. That's not product market fit. That's like a product market fit within that very, very narrow segment of the user base uh, and for your location. Um, so I kind of think about it. Yes, at some point you have to make a call. You can also, I, I think I sp like probably thought about it for too long, expand my world for too long about how we're going to approach it. At some point you have to make a call. When that time is right, it's very personal. It really depends on like the research that you've done. But um, I would say probably spending at least two to three months and really understanding the problem in the customer minimum is what you want to do. And if you are building a consumer product like we are, you want to talk to probably hundreds of people. 
and you want to talk to hundreds of different people, hundreds of different tenants. You then want to go and talk to landlords who serve them. What are their pain points? Um, and that really allows you to kind of go to market very strongly when you truly understand the problem. Um, so you touched base earlier a little bit about fundraising. I want to talk about that right now. Back in March of last year, you raised your first $150,000. Up till now, from what I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, that number is 1.5 million cumulative. Can you walk us through some of the challenges you've experienced, maybe something specific to being a female founder and how you overcame them? So I actually get asked this a lot around, um, you know, did I ever feel a challenge raising money as a female founder? Personally, I never really felt like I was discriminated against based on my gender in any way, whether it's like outright discrimination or just like subconscious bias. The biggest challenge for us was our stage and the fact that we were B2C. So for a stage, we haven't, we didn't have revenue. And like you mentioned, you know, 2021, you could raise $5 million in a pitch deck uh, with no revenue being a B2C startup, but that time is long gone. And I think it's actually long gone forever. Um, and the fact that we were B2C, where you have a lot of distribution concerns, how are you going to acquire customers? Paid marketing is incredibly expensive. And most of the time for B2C companies, you are not making a ton per user. You are monetizing very little, especially early on because you want to attract more users. So how do you show that kind of sustainable business model, ability to really distribute cost effectively, have the lowest cost of customer acquisition as possible? And, you know, do they have belief that, I guess, the problem overall that you're solving and your long-term vision makes sense? Those are the things that I think were the hardest to prove to some investors. The interesting thing for us is our lead investor in our last round, which just closed in February, they had a whole thesis around rent and rewards on rent. So that's one of the things that I would say, if, you, if I was to fundraise right now, one of the things that we did really a good job that helped us massively is being very specific about who you target. There's so many VC funds out there, especially if you take both Canada and the U.S., you want to go out to VC funds who have specific industry knowledge, specific thesis around the, the problem that you're solving, because they can not just move much faster. They don't have to re-educate themselves in the market. They've already been probably talking to other companies who are in a different way trying to solve that problem. They can move much faster. They have much more confidence around the problem you're solving for, and it just makes that fundraising process easier. But it's still a grind. It still took four months, which four months is actually not bad in this climate. Um, and one of the things that really helped is the fact that for four months, all I did was fundraising. And that's why having a team is massive because my co-founders could still push the product further and be launching the product while we were closing this fundraising round. And I couldn't have done it without them being able to oversee that part of the business so I can put the blinders on and just think about money. Very impressive accomplishment. And both of your co-founders uh, are male. So from what I just understood, they were actually leading the team and product development while you were leading the fundraising process. We have, we actually have a great team with that. Like I, I would say the one thing that I would, whatever other venture I'm going to do after Shexi, um, I think the team is massive and who you're partnering with is incredibly important. And I think our skill sets are very well aligned. As we're wrapping up our conversation, can you tell me what advice would you give to women in our audience who perhaps are considering taking that leap of faith and pursuing entrepreneurship? I would say the biggest thing I always say to any entrepreneur um, unrelated of gender is why are you wanting to found a company? Um, motivations to found is key because I actually, as part of the accelerator, have seen multiple different people's motivations to found. And I would say if your motivations to found is to eventually make a lot of money or to, you know, the hype around being an entrepreneur, there's a lot of glamorization around that on the internet about like what it is like, look at my life as a startup founder. By the way, all of that, not true for the most part. Um, you know, if that's what you're doing it for, like the kind of the glamorized part, it's not worth it. Only go into this if like there's this one problem, 
that you have so much passion about solving that you're willing to jump through hoops, you're willing to hear the no's, you're willing to jump on that roller coaster knowing that there's going to be ups and downs, ups are very high, lows are very low. Um, and actually, oftentimes, early days, there's more lows than there's highs, but the highs like make up for it. Um, so that's kind of my opinion. That would be my like my biggest advice is think about why are you doing it? Because if it's something outside of the problem, it's probably not worth it. There's lots of other easier way and less stressful ways to make a lot of money and you know get to fame or whatever. Um, so that would be my biggest advice. And especially for women, I think it's incredibly important to have that self-confidence in yourself, be in that position where you know not just because you're a woman, but just in general as an entrepreneur, you hear no all the time. Can you build enough confidence in yourself to not just sell other people on your vision, but just sell continuously sell yourself? Um, and I think that's key. Thank you for sharing that. The two questions I ask every guest, what do you think is financial freedom? Oh, that's a very tough question because I think it's very personal. I think it really depends on your lifestyle and what, you know, your kind of 10 years from now ideal day looks like. Personally, for me, I have incredible, incredible aspirations. So for me, I think financial freedom is being able to do anything I want to do and being able to buy anything I want to buy. So we're talking like 20 million, 25 million plus, I would say to me, that's financial freedom. I think for most people, it's how do you sustain the lifestyle that you're very comfortable with, that you're very happy with? And what does that number look like? How much money do you need to have? Like, for example, earning that flat 5% a year to be able to never work again. And so if that number is, I don't know, you're currently making 150K and you're very happy with that life, there's nothing else that you really want, you know, 150K a year is what you're looking to make from your investment and you kind of work backwards from that. You're actually the first person on the podcast who brought up a number to the definition of financial freedom. Can I just confirm that 20 million is that a net worth? Or, that's, or personally for me. Oh, that's personally no, for me. That's personally net worth. Net worth. Because <laughs> I was like, you could just buy a yacht for 20 million and that's it. It's it's all gone. Yeah, but this is this is this is this is where I mean it's very personal. Because for someone like buying a yacht, buying a private jet, like that's what they eventually aspire for. For someone, it's having a family and having a very nice upper middle class house going on two vacations a year. I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I don't really care for material things enough. You know me, I've never been one for expensive shoes and expensive brands. Like that's not really something I care about as much. For me, it's the ability to travel. Like I'm all about experiences. Like, can I go anywhere I want to go? Can I go to Alaska and have like the nicest meal flown in by a private chef? Like stuff like that is what I care about doing. And if I want to, you know, have a yacht experience, I'll just rent one. It's actually more financially smart to rent those type of things than to buy it and then have to pay for the maintenance costs and stuff, stuff like that. Totally. There is a reason why they say that for a private jet owner, a owner there are only two happy moments in life when he buys it and when he sells it so probably with yeah. the, the same exactly. Lisa, to wrap up my final question for you we obviously have done quite a bit of a discussion on what financial freedom is what's your advice or tips to women who wish to achieve financial freedom um i think it's twofold i think again it depends on what that number looks like for you uh, but I think there's two things that you absolutely must be doing. And you talk a lot about this on your podcast is investing. I think that's a must. We have to educate ourselves about how to make our money, make us money. Because yes, you might not be making a lot in investment income when you have $10,000 saved in your account. But if you continuously save and invest, that eventually becomes a number that will allow you to not just, you know, not work, Maybe at some point say no to a job that you don't really want and have time to think about what's the next big thing you want to do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have investment income to retire, but it, being able to be picky around where you work, what you do, do you want to go back to school or not, is another, the second part to financial freedom. Because I truly believe that you want to be in a place where work is fun. And it doesn't necessarily mean that every day I can't wait to go to work, but the idea is, 
you enjoy what you're doing, you enjoy the people that you're working with, that's going to be like the necessity for you to be a good professional. And generally people who love what they do, you know, also go through the career at an accelerated pace, make more money. So it's a little bit of a closed loop. So I would say get into saving and investing as, as early as you can. I would say um, leverage credit massively. Uh, we talk about, um, you know, credit cards. Like that's one of the biggest things that my our platform provides is ability to pay rent with credit cards because there's so many, you know, credit cards in the market that if you just put your rent on it for 12 months, that could be your flight on your vacation. That could save you two, three grand. Um, so being very smart about things like this financially, shopping your rates at a bank, shopping your trading platform, uh, making sure you understand the best way to accumulate that wealth is what eventually also allows you to become a better professional if that if working is what you really enjoy doing because it allows you to be picky. And that's great. Lisa, how can our audience start using Chexy? We are national, actually. Um, so anyone, any tenant in Canada can use Chexy to pay their rent with. Um, I would say, especially any tenants who currently pay by e-transfer, that's a great way for you to take advantage of your credit card. Um, just to sign up, go to chexy.co, C-H-E-X-Y dot C-O, and uh, you'll be able to get started there. But also feel free to check out our blogs. We have an active presence on Reddit um, at our Chexy, as well as Instagram at chexy.rent. So um, yeah, check us out and hopefully it's uh, useful and maybe you can fund your next vacation by just paying your rent on time. I love it. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. We'll include all the links in the episode description. You shared so much, like a wealth of knowledge and experience and I really appreciate your time and you being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Sophia. I think the podcast you're building is incredibly important. One of the things that will eventually allow more women to get into saving, to get into investing early and to get to that financial freedom. And as you mentioned, with many of your podcasts and many of the stats you bring up, that is something we really lack on. And I think something that is beneficial for the whole world to change. Thank you all for tuning in today. As always, I want you to give yourself credit for showing up for yourself and your future, because every time you do that, you increase what's financially possible for you. Please share this episode with your family and friends if you enjoyed it, if you loved it, if you know anyone who might benefit from this knowledge and experience that Lisa shared today. I thank you all for being with us and I'll see you on Friday. Bye.